Welcome, I'm Andrea Klesi for Woman's Hospital. Everyone is familiar with diabetes, but what about glucose intolerance? This is a pre-diabetic condition that many people aren't aware of. Dr. Karen Elkind Hirsch explains what this means to women. When we talk about glucose intolerance, the only way it, it, one can realize they have glucose intolerance, or what we call pre-diabetes, is um, through a glucose tolerance test. Because really, by definition, we have certain levels of blood sugars that are we consider normal, um, like fasting levels, we want them less than 100. Um, if your fasting level, let's say, is 126 and above, you're considered diabetic. But there's that gray zone in between, <laughs> between 100 and 126, where you're not diabetic, but you're not normal. And that's somebody who we call impaired fasting glucose, which is part of that glucose intolerance. Most people, when we talk about glucose intolerance, are a response to a sugar load. So when you do a glucose tolerance test, you give them a load of sugar, a 75 gram load of sugar, and after you take bloods at a half an hour, an hour, and then you look at them at two hours. That's kind of the, the, the critical time period. And so we say after two hours of giving a large sugar load that your sugar should be less than 140, okay? Um, irrespective really of what you started with. If it's above 140, but it's less than 200, if it's 200 and above, you're diabetic. But if it's somewhere in that gray zone again, that is what we call impaired glucose tolerance. And so that's how we diagnose that, that disorder or what we are now calling prediabetes. So the thing is, is that once again, where you're asymptomatic, you don't know what your blood sugar, unless you're somebody who's pricking your finger, you know, two hours after you, at, before you eat and after you eat, you have no idea what your blood sugar level is. The only time people probably are aware of their blood sugar levels are when they get really low. That's when you sort of get the shakes and things like that. Um, that's completely the opposite of that. That's called hypoglycemia, and that's when your blood sugar gets really low. Um, after you take too much insulin, you'll see people sometimes become, and we worry about that because people die from hypoglycemia. Hyperglycemia, which is elevated blood sugar, would have to get to such high levels before it would actually impact you physiologically. Um, because when you eat a big sugar load, your blood sugar goes up and then it comes down. And in these people, it just stays up. And it's, it's, it's not without its effect because high levels of sugar can affect your cardiovascular system, your renal system, your eyes, and things like that. Um, but you're not aware of it unless it's over a long period of time and, and it starts doing damage. But you, didn't, you don't physically feel different when your blood sugar is elevated. So that's, that's one of the difficulties in diagnosing this is that you really have to go in and get a test done. And um, it's sort of being proactive. So who's at risk? Again, family history of diabetes. We can't change our genetics. So people with a strong family history, a mother, father, close family, or even a grandparent are at risk. Um, certain ethnic groups, once again, have a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. Therefore, you, I always tell people you don't just develop diabetes overnight. You're not normal and then the next day diabetic. You kind of go through this period of what we call pre-diabetes, um, where you start not being able to metabolize your sugar normally. And so it's, you know, that's when we're trying to catch people before they do it because we can reverse it. Um, so again, um, African Americans, Hispanics, higher risk. Um, obesity, overweight, again, that's one of the reasons now we're seeing it in younger people. Um, so that's another large group that has it. There are certain um, endocrine disorders, one um, called polycystic ovary syndrome, where we know part of the disorders related to insulin resistance, and these women are at a much higher risk for, in fact, many of them are pre-diabetic and at risk for type 2 diabetes. So um, that's pretty much the, the, the categories that um, are at risk for what we call pre-diabetes. So what are the treatments of that? And unfortunately, um, there, except for diet and exercise, which you know is good for all of us, there really is no approved treatment for a non-disease. I mean, drugs are to treat diseases, not pre-diseases. Although there are, have been a lot of research looking at, can we use some of these quote-unquote diabetes drugs 
for the pre-diabetic and maybe prevent it. So probably the one that's been studied the most um, is a drug called metformin. Um, and what it is, is um, we use it, it is the first line of therapy for type 2 diabetes as well, is what we call an insulin sensitizing drug. And what we mean by that is when one develops diabetes, part of the syndrome is their insulin does not as effectively normalize their blood sugar. So you might be putting out a bunch of insulin, but you have to put out more than, let's say, somebody who's sensitive to insulin to get your blood sugar back to normal. So what we're trying to do is get that person back to being sensitive to their own insulin. So that's one of the drugs that, that has been looked at in the pre-diabetic. There have been some other drugs. One are the TZDs, but there's been some a lot of stuff now about them having some cardiovascular effects. And so you, you really, and they've talked about taking them off the, the market. Um, so for certainly a healthy population that isn't diabetic, that doesn't have to have this because their blood sugars are still normal, um, it is, we've, we've kind of backed off from using those. There are some new drugs on the market. They're called GLP-1 agonists or incretins. And um, there's been some initial work done with them. And these drugs actually make you secrete your insulin more effectively. So um, that's how they work. And we use them alone or in combination with the metformin. So that's kind of what is out there again. There is no approved drug for the treatment of pre-diabetes. So um, that's, that's the only the thing. So these are all kind of what we call off-label. If, if you're kind of, as I say, going down, I think, of it, like I said before, there's you're normal and then you're not just diabetic. There's this sort of, like I call the slippery slope of becoming going from normal to diabetic. So can we reverse it? Can we go back? Um, and probably the best data on that is been a 10-year trial now called the Diabetes Prevention Trials. They're called the DPP. There's been tons of stuff, thousands of people are enrolled. And what they did in that study, um, which is why it's, it's exciting, is they took people with impaired glucose tolerance. So they were impaired. They already were on the way down the slope. And they kind of intervened with certain treatments. Some were on drug intervention, some were intensive lifestyle intervention. And what they found um, is, is that, in fact, if one could change their lifestyle and diet and exercise and whatnot, that they were able to prevent the progression of this disease. Not only prevent the progression, but some of these people actually went back and became more, had now became normalized. So there is pl plenty of data out there, but it's, it's, it's a radical lifestyle change. Um, the medical intervention, it was interesting in women they, they looked at it overall, and actually it turned out lifestyle intervention turned out to be the best intervention if you looked at everyone in the DPPP trials. Interestingly enough, they took a subset of women who had gestational diabetes, and they looked at that group, and they found out that the drug treatment was as effective, if not more effective, in that particular cohort of women. So the question now is whether that is a different disease, or is it because somebody who has a baby that that trying to make that lifestyle change is a very very unrealistic goal and that in fact it is much easier to at least during that period of your life take medicine and control it and then hopefully while you're doing that get back into a lifestyle change and those are questions that still need to be answered um, with diabetes prevention but but it looks like we certainly we don't know if, if we can forever prevent it but we're certainly delaying it and that's key for every year we delay it, it's important. So certainly 10 years is significant. For more information, visit womans.org. Womans, exceptional care centered on you.